Era la sed y el hambre, y tú fuiste la fruta. Era el duelo y las ruinas, y tú fuiste el milagro. There were thirst and hunger, and you were the fruit. They were grief and ruins, and you were the miracle. Pablo Neruda, The Song of Despair. Chapter 1. One of the very first bullets comes in through the open window above the toilet where Luca is standing. He doesn't immediately understand that it's a bullet at all, and it's only luck that it doesn't strike him between the eyes. Luca hardly registers the mild noise it makes as it flies past and lodges into the tiled wall behind him. But the wash of bullets that follows is loud, booming, and thudding, clack clacking with helicopter speed. There's a raft of screams, too, but that noise is short lived soon exterminated by the gunfire. Before Luca can zip his pants, lower the lid, climb up to look out before he has time to verify the source of that terrible clamor, the bathroom door swings open and Mommy is there. Mi joven, she says, so quietly that Luca doesn't hear her. Her hands are not gentle. She propels him toward the shower. He trips on the raised tile step and falls forward onto his hands. Mommy lands on top of him and his teeth Pierce his lip in the tumble. He tastes blood. One dark droplet makes a tiny circle of red against the bright green shower tile. Mommy shoves Luca into the corner. There's no door on this shower, no curtain. It's only a corner of his abuela's bathroom with a third tiled wall built to suggest a stall. This wall is around five and a half feet high and three feet long, just large enough with some luck to shield Luca and his mother from sight. Luca's back is wedged, his small shoulders touching both walls. His knees are drawn up to his chin, and Mommy is clenched around him like a tortoise shell. The door of the bathroom remains open, which worries Luca, though he can't see beyond the shield of his mother's body, behind the half barricade of his abuela's shower wall. He liked to wriggle out and tip that door lightly with his finger. He liked to shut it. He doesn't know that his mother left it open on purpose that a closed door only invites closer scrutiny. The clatter of gunfire outside continues, joined by an odor of charcoal and burning meat. Papi is grilling carne asada out there and Luca's favorite chicken drumsticks. He likes them only a tiny bit blackened, the crispy tang of the skins. His mother pulls her head up long enough to look into him, look him in the eye. She puts her hand on both sides of his face and tries to cover his ears. Outside, the gunfire slows. It ceases and then returns in short bursts, mirroring, Luca thinks, the sporadic and wild rhythm of his heart. In between the racket, Luca can hear the radio, a woman's voice announcing, La mejor 100.1 FM Acapulco, followed by Banda MS singing about how happy they are to be in love. Someone shoots the radio and then there's laughter. Men's voices. Two or three. Luca can't tell. Hard boot steps on Abuelo's patio. Is he here? One of the voices is just outside the window. Here? What about the kid? Mira, there's a boy here. This him? Luca's cousin Adrian. He's wearing cleats and his Hernandez jersey. Adrian can juggle a balloon de football on his knees 47 times without dropping it. I don't know. Looks the right age. Take a picture. Hey, chicken, another voice says. Man, this looks good. You want some chicken? Luca's head is beneath his mommy's chin. Her body knotted tightly around him. Forget the chicken, pendejo. Check the house. Luca's mommy rocks in her squatting position, pushing Luca even harder into the tiled wall. She squeezes against him, and together they hear the squeak and bang of the back door. Footsteps in the kitchen. The intermittent rattle of bullets in the house. Mommy turns her head and noise, notices, vivid against the tile floor, the lone spot of Luca's blood, illuminated by the slant of the light from the window. Luca feels her breath snag in her chest. The house is quiet now. The hallway that ends at the door of this bathroom is carpeted. Mommy tugs her shirt sleeve over the, her hand, and Luca's watches in horror as she leans away from him toward that telltale splatter of blood. She runs her sleeve over it, leaving behind only a faint smear and then pitches back to him just as the man in the hallway uses the butt of his AK-47 to nudge the door the rest of the way open. There must be three of them because Lucas can still hear two voices in the yard. On the other side of the shower wall, the man unzips his pants and empties his bladders into Abuela's toilet. Luca does not breathe. Mommy does not breathe. 
their eyes are closed, their bodies motionless, even their adrenaline is suspended within the calcified will of their stillness. The man hiccups, flushes, washes his hands, he dries them on Abuela's good yellow towel, the one she puts out only for parties. They don't move after the man leaves, even after they hear the squeak and bang once more of the kitchen door. They stay there, fixed in a tight knot of arms and legs and knees and chins and clenched eyelids and locked fingers, even after they hear the man join his compatriots outside. After they hear him announce that the house is clear and he's going to eat some chicken now, because there's no excuse for letting good barbecue chicken go to waste, not when there are children starving in Africa. The man is still close enough outside the window that Luca can hear the moist, rubbery, smacking sounds his mouth makes with the chicken. Luca concentrates on breathing in and out without sound. He tells himself that this is just a bad dream, a terrible dream, but one he's had many times before. He always awakens, heart pounding, and finds himself flooded with relief. It was just a dream. Because these are the modern boogeymen of urban Mexico. Because even parents who take care not to discuss the violence in front of them, to change the radio station when there's news of another shooting, to conceal the worst of their own fears, cannot prevent their children from talking to other children. On the swings, at the football field, in the boys' bathroom at school, the gruesome stories gather and swell. These kids, rich, poor, middle class, have all seen bodies in the streets. Casual murder. And they know from talking to one another that there's a hierarchy of danger and that some families are at greater risk than others. So although Luca never saw the least scrap of evidence of that risk from his parents, even though they demonstrated their courage impeccably before their son, he knew. He knew this day would come. But that truth does nothing to soften its arrival. It's a long, long while before Luca's mother removes the clamp of her hand from the back of his neck, before she leans back far enough for him to notice that the angle of lights falling through the bathroom window has changed. There's a blessing in the moment after terror and before confirmation. When at last he moves his body, Luca experiences a brief lurching acceleration at the very fact of his being alive. For a moment, he enjoys the ragged passage of breath through his chest. He places his palms flat to feel the cool press of tiles beneath his skin. Mommy collapses against the wall across from him and works her jaw in a way that reveals the dimple in her left cheek. It's weird to see her good church shoes in the shower. Luca touches a cut on his lip. The blood has dried there, but he scratches it with his teeth and it opens again. He understands that were this a dream, he would not taste blood. At length, mommy stands. Stay here, she instructs him in a whisper. Don't move until I come back for you. Don't make a sound, you understand? Luca lunges for her hand. Mommy, don't go. Mijo, I'll be right back. You stay here. Mommy pries Luca's fingers from her hand. Don't move, she says again. Good boy. Luca finds it easy to obey his mother's directives. Not so much because he's an obedient child, but because he doesn't want to see. His whole family out there in Abuela's backyard. Today is Saturday, April 7th. His cousin Jennifer's quinceañera, her 15th birthday party. She's wearing a long white dress. Her father and mother are there, Tio Alex and Tia Yemi and Jennifer's younger brother, Adrian, who, because he already turned nine, likes to say he's a year older than Luca, even though they're really only four months apart. Before Luca had to pee, he and Adrian had been kicking the balloon around with their other primos. The mothers had been sitting around the table at the patio, at the patio, their ice palomas sweating on their napkins. The last time they were all together at Abuela's house, Jennifer had accidentally walked in on Luca in the bathroom, and Luca was so mortified that today he made Mommy come with him and stand guard outside the door. Abuela didn't like it. She told Mommy she was coddling him, that a boy his age should be able to go to the bathroom by himself. But Luca is only a child, so he gets away with things other kids don't. In any case, Luca is alone in the bathroom now, and he tries not to think about it. But the thought swarms up, unabiding, those irritable words Mommy and Abuela exchanged were perhaps the very last ones between them, ever. Luca had approached the table, wriggling, whispered into Mommy's ear, and Abuela, seeing this, had shaken her head, wagged in an admonishing finger at both of them, passed her remarks. She had a way of smiling when she criticized, but Mommy was always on Luca's side. 
She rolled her eyes and pushed her chair back from the table anyway, ignoring her mother's disapproval. When was that? Ten minutes ago? Two hours? Luca feels unmoored from the boundaries of time that have always existed. Outside the window, he hears Mommy's tentative footsteps, the soft scuff of her shoe through the remnants of something broken, a solitary gasp too windy to be called a sob. Then, a quickening of sound as she crosses the patio with purpose. He presses the keys on her phone. When she speaks, her voice has a stretched quality that Luca has never heard before, high and tight in the back of her throat. Send help. 